great pleasure to kick off the series with a talk by two new Vector faculty members. Uh, the first talk is from Jeff Kloon, who is new to Vector, relatively new to Vector, but certainly not new to the machine learning and deep learning community. I've known Jeff for a long time through his different worlds. First, um, I think I got to know him first as a, a professor at University of Wyoming. Uh, he was also involved in a startup, Geometric uh, Learning and Geometric Intelligence, I believe, and then that was sold to Uber. And he uh, was one of the founding members of the Uber AI Labs. Uh, did really incredible Merck making uh, contributions to reinforcement learning and um, uh, evolutionary computing, uh, generative models. And uh, I also uh, have shared an interest in some applied work on e ecology uh, with with Jeff. Um, so he's he's just done a, a lot of amazing work and we're so proud and happy to have him with Vector. Uh, today he is work uh, going to be talking about um, some work. Uh, I don't see see the title uh, uh, for you, so I will say that it is improving robot and deep reinforcement learning via quality, diversity, open-ended, and AI generating algorithms. So Jeff, the floor is yours. Looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Can someone confirm that you can see my slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Hey, the sun's coming out here in British Columbia. Um, so uh, it's an honor to be a part of Vector and it's an honor to give this talk. Thank you to the organizers and to everyone at Vector and the Fields Institute. So the goal of this talk is to try to share some work that represents what may for many of you be a very different approach to reinforcement learning. Uh, and that includes some of the things that Graham just mentioned, quality diversity algorithms and open-ended algorithms. And at the very end, I wanna take a step back and kind of look at the highest level and grandest ambitions of our field uh, and how we might get all the way to those, accomplishing those goals, including this idea that I have called AI generating algorithms. So I want to start by, by pointing out that there's a paradox in life, which is if you try too hard to solve a task, you'll likely fail. But if you entirely ignore the objective you're trying to solve, you're ironically more likely to succeed. And that's exemplified by this metaphor of this maze. So imagine that you're this an agent down here on the bottom left, and you're trying to go to, uh, you have a, like a re reinforcement learning algorithm that only rewards you for getting closer to the goal. Well, then you'll go north and you'll butt your head against the wall forever. However, if you just go and explore the world that you find yourself in, then you'll trivially solve this maze. Now, you may think that that's a simple example that doesn't apply to the real world, but in fact, this happens all throughout society. So if you go back, for example, in uh, technology to like this cooking technology seen in the top left here, and if you are the queen of this kingdom and you will only fund researchers who will improve your ability to cook food fast and with less smoke, you would never invent the modern microwave because to do that, you had to have been working on radar technology and notice that a chocolate bar melted in your pocket. Similarly, if you went back to the time of the abacus and you said, I will only fund scientists who make more compute per hour, you will never get the modern computer. You might get an abacus with longer rods, more beads, maybe a three-dimensional abacus, but you won't get the modern computer because to do that, you had to have been working on vacuum tubes and electricity, technologies that were not being pursued because they helped vis-a-vis -vis computation. And so the conjecture here is that the only way to solve really hard problems is by creating the problems while you solve them, like scientists do, and then trying to solve those problems and switching between the two, catching serendipity within your algorithm. So what do we mean by this idea of serendipity or goal switching? Well, imagine if you're a roboticist and you're trying to get a bipedal walking robot, and all of a sudden you notice that your robot is crawling or balancing on one leg. The idea is don't throw that out because that doesn't measurably improve your ability to walk forward. Instead, start trying to perfect and practice those goals and tasks as well, because those might end up being stepping stones to ultimately lead you to bipedal walking. So these kind of this paradigm, these ideas have kind of been formulated into this growing subfield of AI that my colleagues and I are creating called quality diversity algorithms. And the idea here is instead of having an algorithm that goes out and returns one single best solution that it found in a search space, QD algorithms return a diverse set of high performing uh, policies or agents or solutions or whatever it is. Just like natural evolution produced all these weird but marvelous creatures that are all very different and very good at what they do. 
So the most popular algorithm right now in quality diversity algorithms is called Map Elites. It was co-invented by Jean-Baptiste Moray and myself a few years back. And the idea is very simple. So imagine you have a, like a robot you're trying to optimize, say it's body, and you have a performance measure like speed, but you also can pick dimensions of variations for which you'd like to see diversity. So here is an example, we'll pick height and weight. Well, then the algorithm is very simple. All it does is it randomly initializes itself by creating a random agent, figuring out its height and weight and, and evaluating its performance, which I'm showing here in color and putting it in the right cell. And then you just run this loop forever. You grab something out of the map, change it somehow, reevaluate it, see where it goes. And if it's the best thing you've ever seen at that point in the map, swap it in. That's it. And the difference is, again, this algorithm returns kind of a set of solutions and teaches you a lot about your search space. So let's see an example. So we applied this problem to this soft robotics problem. We were trying to uh, get the bodies of these robots dialed in. And all of the gates that you see here were produced by different runs. So this is prior to our work. What we wanted to see is all this diversity show up within one run, like you see in evolution and culture. And so we ran qu classic optimization, just rewarded for high performance, and you see very low performance and not a lot of exploration of the space. If you explicitly encourage performance plus diversity in these dimensions in a multi-objective sense, you get higher performance, but you still don't get a lot of exploration. But I want you to see with the same amount of compute, the difference that a quality diversity algorithm has. It's just a complete sea change in how much you illuminate the space and come to understand where you can do well, where you can't, the different local optima, et cetera. Uh, so we, this was very exciting to see. Also of interest is that nearby points in the map are similar types of solutions because they are nearby in the map of these dimensions of variation. And so you can kind of sweep around with your own eyes at different points in this map and see variations on the theme, which will come to harness later on in algorithms. Just like you look out into nature and you can see the great cats and variations on size and color, et cetera. Another thing that's really essential, going back to the idea of goal switching and serendipity, is that if you take the final solution at any point in the map and you trace its history, where did it spend time across its optimization history in the map? What you do not see is that it basically is trying to become the best at that one thing forever. Instead, you see these long circuitous paths through the space, which basically show that there is a curriculum here, but you wouldn't have been able to intuit this particular curriculum ahead of time. But you needed that to create the computer or the abacus in this particular world. So, uh, sorry, create the computer or the uh, microwave. Uh, okay, so I wanna show you two examples of how we're gonna harness the ideas of QD to try to do interesting things. The first one is from this nature paper we had in 2015, uh, where we're gonna try to have robots that rapidly adapt to damage. So here is your robot. It is out there like finding survivors or whatever you want it to do. And it, like a brick falls on it and it becomes damaged. What you don't want it to do is stop doing its job. And so we looked to analysts. We said, how could we get very sample efficient damage adaptation? And animals you know, do not do what a reinforcement learning algorithm does. A typical RL algorithm will try millions or billions of tiny variations on the, the best thing found so far, which is very sample inefficient. Instead, animals have totally different, intuition, different intuitions about totally different ways to move. They, once they become damaged, they conduct a few intelligent tests and they figure out something that works despite the damage. And, you know, maybe they limp back home or um, continue to do whatever it is that they were trying to do. So how can we do that? Well, we can run map elites ahead of time in simulation on an undamaged robot and basically find a diverse set of high performing solutions. Here we use uh, a six dimensional hypercube, which is the amount of time that each leg touches the ground. Uh, and after that training, that serves as a prior to Bayesian optimization for you know, how good are each of these different types of gates. And we'll see how this works in practice. So here is our undamaged gate. This is a hand programmed gate. It moves straight at 0.25 meters per second, and then the robot becomes damaged. <clears throat> so here you see it's curved and the performance is very slow. Now, keep your eyes on the map. Every time we do an experiment in the real world, we can update the map to say, oh, you know, how this prior information, which came from the undamaged simulated robot, you know, how does that gate work on the damaged real robot? And so you'll see is that we'll update the, the, the performance prediction for that gate, but we'll also update all the nearby gates because nearby gates are similar. So if one gate doesn't work, it's probably true that all similar gates won't work. And so we'll jump to a totally different part of the space to grab our solution. And what you'll see is here about 24 seconds in, we now have a gate that is straight and has recovered the original performance of effectively 0.25 meters per second. And that all happened in a handful of trials. 
So we did a lot of experiments in this with different damage conditions and different robots. And in all cases, this, this algorithm works extremely well. And we also did some ablations. If you run Bayesian optimization or policy gradients directly in the search space, nothing works at all. The performance is terrible. It's map elites that gives you the best lip, uh, lift, and then minor variants on that, you know, basically are, are smaller improvements in performance. So to conclude this chapter of the talk, I hope that I've shown you that quality diversity algorithms uh, have some exciting properties because they give you this set of high performing diverse solutions. And here we use that as fuel for Bayesian optimization. And um, I also think it's kind of interesting in its own right that we can make robots adapt so quickly. Here is a second example I wanna show you of how you can use QD ideas. So this is a paper that was also in Nature last year in 2021. Uh, and the idea here is that a grand change in reinforcement learning are hard exploration domains. These are domains in which you get, you know, there's actually two types. One are sparse problems to very infrequently get reward signal from the environment, yet you still have to figure out what to do. And a classic example of that is Montezuma's Revenge. And it, our algorithms were so bad on this problem that it became a grand challenge for the field with many people trying to solve it and not making much progress. There's an even harder type of problem, which is a deceptive problem, where the reward function is actually lying to you and telling you the wrong thing in the short term. For in, in this game of Pitfall, for example, almost everything you do until you're very skilled leads to negative reward because you hit enemies and you fall down on holes and things. And so every RL algorithm was just learning to stand still and do nothing. So that was the only thing, only way to avoid the cruel and unusual world of negative points in this game. But that's obviously not the right long-term solution. So classic algorithms on these domains scored, you know, somewhere between zero and 2,500 points. And on Pitfall, nobody had ever scored a single point. So you might think to yourself, okay, well, if the reward function is not giving me any signal or gradient, I should Am I back? Can people hear me? Am I back? You're back. It's all good. Great. Thank you. Sorry. All right. Sorry. So we would want our, you might think we want our algorithms to be intrinsically motivated. Just go find new situations, new states, uh, explore the world and you'll be good. And people tried this over and over again, including myself. But what you see is mostly a graveyard of failed efforts. So these are all performance on Montezuma's Revenge. Some algorithms that are intrinsically motivated, they help a little bit. And about three weeks before we put Go Explore online, there was a lot of excitement and fanfare over this paper from OpenAI. They got all the way up to a score of about 11,000 on this problem. And I spent a lot of time, this is while I was at Uber, trying to think, why isn't intrinsic motivation doing better? It's, it's leaving so much on the table in these games. Uh, what's wrong? What's not working? And so the answer, I, I think there's actually two pop problems that we identified for why intrinsically motivated RL is still failing. Uh, and one of them I call detachment. So imagine that you're an agent here in this maze and you're intrinsically motivated. So green are places you haven't been yet. If you go there, you'll get an intrinsic reward. So the policy might start off to the left. You see it in purple here, exploring and getting lots of green. And then by chance, because we're always trying to like sprinkle in exploration to find new green, the policy might flip to the right because there's a lot of green over there too so it explores that whole side of the maze but then what happens the policies run out of things to do on the right it's been trained to go to the right go to the right go to the right and now it's not getting any green on the right so it starts random by random perturbation maybe it flips to the left no green flips to the right no green it's what we say is detached from and forgotten about this promising frontier of exploration that it knew about a long time ago so our proposal is simply to explicitly remember these promising stepping stones, where they are, and how to get back to them. The other pathology that I think plagues these algorithms, I call derailment. So imagine that you're a, a robot here and you're trying to find a reward somewhere on this wall. You don't know where it is. Imagine that you got, you did really well. You got all the way up there, which is really, really hard to do. Well, what will every intrinsically motivated RL algorithm do? It will try to run the policy again, but it will 
is sprinkling exploration in the hopes of finding something new, but it will even do that while we're just trying to get back to that arrow. Now, this was a long, complicated trajectory we just ran, so we'll probably just knock the robot off the wall. We'll derail it from getting back to that green arrow. And the, the error in thinking, in my opinion, is that we don't want to explore while returning to that arrow. We want to explore after return to that arrow. So our, our, our paper in Nature was actually called First Return, Then Explore. And the idea is that we first want to go back to this situation and then explore from there, hence the Go Explore algorithm name. So in phase one of Go Explore, we're first going to initialize the algorithm by just taking some random actions. And every time we get to a state, we'll add that to the archive. Then we're going to run this loop forever. We pull something out of the archive, one of these stepping stones. We go back to it with no exploration at all if we can help it. Then we explore from it. And then if we get to any new states, we add them to the archive. There's one extra twist, which is that if we go back to a state, but in a better path, either with more rewards or more efficiently, we'll swap that in as the preferred path back to that state. So I hope this is ringing some bells for you because this is effectively the ideas of quality diversity. We are trying to figure out the best way to get to a diverse set of states. So quality and diversity. Now, I like to contrast Go Explore with intrinsic motivation th with this metaphor. Intrinsic motivation, if you're trying to search a house, is like a very narrow beam flashlight being shined somewhere in the house. And if that beam is drawn towards areas it hasn't been to, but it's always focused in one area at a time. And go, the policy is going there, going there, going there. In contrast, Go Explore is like turning the lights on in the living room of the house and then the adjacent rooms of the living room, and then those adja the adjacent rooms to those rooms in kind of an expanding sphere of light that will eventually will illuminate the entire house. So we have these two phases in Go Explore. In phase one, we're just going to try to figure out where the reward is, like how to solve this particular problem. And then in phase two, we're going to practice doing that solution in the face of a lot of noise and become very general and robust. We don't want to mix those two things up, which is what most algorithms will do. So when we did this, we ended up getting four times the previous state of the art, a score of four, which we were tremendously excited about. Now, we could do even better, and that's because, in my opinion, ideal algorithms do not need domain knowledge, and Go Explore does not need that. But if you can give domain knowledge to the algorithm, it should be able to take advantage of it. And that's really easy to do in Go Explore by simply, you know, in the definition of what counts as an interesting new state in phase one. I just want to point out this domain knowledge is not used in the final neural net. It just plays from pixel. But it's kind of like figuring out what is the high-performing thing to even do before we practice doing that. That's when we use this domain knowledge. And when we added that thing in, things got kind of ridiculous. We ended up getting an average of 660,000 points, and our best neural nets can score arbitrarily high. We saw one get as high as 18 million, and we beat the human world record on this game of 1.2 million points. So this is just you know a sea change in what's possible in this hard exploration domain. On Pitfall, as I said, no prior algorithm had ever scored a single point, and we effectively got all of the points possible in this game, dramatically advancing the state of the art. We applied it to all of the Atari games, and on every single game, we beat humans. And um, in many of them, we got state-of-the-art results. And we actually ended up solving all of the unsolved Atari games in the Atari benchmark that existed at that time, which is exciting. We also applied it to a simulator robotics task, but the reward and tell it its toys away in the cupboard. And as you see, intrinsically motivated RL PPO or uh, policy gradients is in orange, a flat line with zero score, and Go Explore is in blue and solves the task every single time. So to conclude this chapter of the talk, Go Explore represents a new approach for hard exploration problems. I think it opens up a lot of exciting research directions. But once again, for the purposes of this talk, it shows the value of quality diversity algorithms in collecting this diverse repertoire of high quality entity. So I hope I've encouraged you to think about whether or not these algorithms are interesting, uh, but I still also want to think about what's missing, you know, and I think the answer is that no matter how good they are, they're still stuck in a particular environment. Typically in machine learning, we pick a problem like Go or Dota and we bang away at it until it's solved and then humans pick the next problem to work on. But what I'm really interested in, my colleagues and I have been working on this for over 15 years, is could we create what we call open-ended algorithms that will literally innovate and learn forever? And examples of this are natural evolution and human culture. You know, evolution has been going for 3.5 billion years and continues to surprise us, for example, with COVID. And, it, you know, it produced jaguars, hawks, the human brain, and everything that you see in this picture. And so I think one of the essential things that these open-ended algorithms do is they invent problems and they 
then when that problem becomes solved, the solution itself is another new opportunity or learning problem. For example, evolution produced leaves high up in trees. It then solved that problem with caterpillars and giraffes. And then those things become new opportunities for things that prey on them or cooperate with them. And so our latest attempt to try to get this, uh, so one of these algorithms to work is POET. Uh, and the title summarizes what we're after, which is to endlessly generate increasingly complex and diverse learning environments and their solutions. So POET periodically will do, it's pretty simple. We're just gonna basically create the ability to generate environments and we're gonna generate le learning new environments and we're gonna add them to a growing set of events if they're not too easy and not too hard for the current agents. And then we're also simultaneously going to optimize agents to chew better at those challenges. And importantly, we're going to allow goal switching. So if you're, if you're working on one environment and then all of a sudden you end up being the best thing we've ever seen on another environment, we'll basically copy that policy over and let it start working on that other environment too. So everything you see here was generated automatically by the system. And what you, it, on its own, it figured out that it should first work separately on things like gaps and stumps and rugged terrain and that eventually once the agent becomes more skilled you'll see that it starts to go for bigger gaps bigger um, stumps etc and then also it starts to put together these challenges so now we're really seeing kind of the robot being pushed to the limit of its body the biggest gaps it can jumps the biggest stumps it can go over and very rugged terrain all figured out automatically by the system now, we took the final really hard environments that the system generated and solved, and then we went back and said, could we have just directly optimized an agent to learn with the same exact learning uh, optimization algorithm, which in this case is uh, evolution strategies. And what we found is that every, in every single time, direct optimization fails. You really needed that curriculum to be able to achieve and solve that task. Now, you might say that's unfair. I could have just created a direct path curriculum by say, taking the starting environment, taking the final environment, and maybe linearly interpreting the amount of ruggedness or the size of the gaps or stumps, et cetera. So we did that. And in every single case that also failed because eventually there was one gap too big to cross. Not, not, you know, not for this curriculum, uh, whether it was a gap or a stump or whatever. There's always a problem that, you know, it couldn't solve. And so this goal switching idea was really essential to get this to work. You had to basically let serendipity happen. And maybe the best solution to this particular problem came from some totally other weird thing that uh, was produced by the algorithm somewhere else in the search space. So this is one of the plots I'm most proud of in my entire scientific career. I've been trying to get this plot for 15 years. What you're seeing here is a phylogenetic tree of the environments created by the system. And what you're seeing is deep sustained diversity. This is the equivalent of having, you know, the big cats and the big dogs and birds and dinosaurs. A lot of variations on a theme within kind of a species, but also many species simultaneously being pursued. In this case, it's in environments. So you can think about these as water worlds and sand dune worlds or treetop worlds worlds, et cetera, and different creatures that specialize in those different worlds, all happening within one run. So I find this extremely encouraging to start seeing in our open-ended algorithms. So recently, somebody took Poet and they basically uh, applied the as cool as, as cool as Boston Dynamics robots, but automatically produced with Poet-like principles, which was very exciting. I also get really excited about the future here. You know, like compute gets exponentially cheaper each year. So what will happen when we can unleash Poet in a world as complicated as this? I think the sky is really the limit for this kind of research. All right, so to conclude the Poet section of the talk, I think Poet shows the benefits of quality diversity algorithms, including generating challenges while solving them. And there's lots of future exciting possibilities. Okay, now I promised you that I would want take a step back uh, and think about the grandest ambitions of our fields. If, you, if we want to make AGI, and that is a separate and important conversation, I still think it's interesting to think about how we might get all the way there. And so, you know, if you look out to machine learning right now, most of the work that's happening is what I call the manual path to AI. The idea is that we're going to identify all of these different building blocks uh, that you see. And here's like kind of an example, a laundry list of papers that you might see uh, at, you know, iClear, at ICML, at, at NeurIPS. And people are like, you know, here's a building block that I think is important. And here's maybe an improved version of it. But I think that kind of raises the question of, you know, how many more building blocks are out there that we have to discover? Are there hundreds or are there thousands? And can we find them all manually? But even if we could do that, then there's this implied phase two that's not often talked about. But at some point, we'll have to put all these things together. And that is just such a Herculean task. I think we should be clear eyed about what it would really take to debug and tune such a complicated system. Uh, is that even possible? 
But I think there's a clear trend in machine learning that calls into question the manual path. And that's the idea that without a doubt, pipelines that are hand designed are replaced by entirely learned pipelines as we get more compute and more data. We've seen that with all of the different things listed here, features, architectures, you know, just a couple of days ago, we saw optimization algorithms and the list will just grow and grow. And so I think the writing's on the wall that there's an alternative path to producing really powerful AI systems, if not AGI. And I call these AI generating algorithms. And so the idea here is that you want to basically have the system learn as much of the solution as possible. And that allows you to bootstrap from initial of very simple origins all the way up to produce you know, very powerful AI. It's probably gonna look like an outer loop that's searching over the place of, uh, over the space of agents and architectures and optimizers and learning algorithms. And eventually it will produce something that's very, very sample efficient, just as Earth with Darwinian evolution was very, very sample inefficient, but eventually produced you, the human mind, which is the most sample efficient learner that we know of. And so if we want to make progress on AI GAs, I think we need to push simultaneously on three pillars. We need to middle learn the architectures, the learning algorithms themselves, and we also need to automatically generate effective learning environments. Now, my team has worked on all three of these pillars, uh, and so many other people has done a lot of really great work. But in this talk, I've really focused on pillar three, automatically generating effective learning environments. I think it's very interesting. It's very difficult. It's probably the least explored of the pillars. And therefore, I think the most uh, exciting for me as a researcher. And what I've been trying to maybe plant in your mind is that the ideas from quality diversity algorithms and open-ended algorithms could really help us accomplish this goal. And POET is one example of um, putting those ideas to work for pillar three. Also, people have been combining pillars recently. There's this wonderful work out of OpenAI on Rubik's Cube, which trained a generalist policy on automatically generated challenges that learned its own reinforcement learning algorithm to solve Rubik's Cube on a real robot. <clears throat> and then there's this great work out of the open-ended team at DeepMind on uh, Excellent, which could tra which trained on automatically generated worlds and then zero-shouted tasks like hide and seek, uh, capture the flag, et cetera, which is just incredible. So, you know, when I put these ideas in front of iClear and uh, Josh Tenenbaum was on the panel and he basically said, this sounds fantastic, but how are you gonna do this without a planet sized computer? Is that possible? So my hypothesis is yes, but I think that's kind of one of the challenges in the field. And there's many different ways it might happen. But one of the things I wanna highlight is the modern trend, which is that from Newton, AI can go faster and, and see farther by standing on the shoulders of giant human data sets. And so that's one of the ways I think we could speed up AI GAs. So I want to quickly just introduce one recent work we had out of my team at OpenAI, it'll be at NURPS this year, which can show you how we might be, do that. So this is video pre-training. And the idea here is that, you know, if you want an open-ended learning algorithm, every time it tries to solve a challenge, you know, if there's a hard exploration challenge there, then it might fail to learn anything, or at least you might that challenge. So exploration still is this Achilles heel that is a giant tax on the system. So what might we do? Well, you could use something like Go Explore or other algorithms, but there's another solution which we see with all of the modern work on unsupervised uh, and, and self-supervised learning, which is we can just use human data to speed everything up. We can give our agents a lot of a head start with a lot of knowledge about how to solve whatever tasks that are that we're putting in front of them. For example, on the internet are endless hours of video tutorials on how to use your computer, how to use Photoshop, how to play Minecraft, you know, how to make chairs and tables, et cetera. So could we have agents watch internet videos and learn what to do in our hard RL domains? And the answer we show is yes. So we took, we chose Minecraft because there's lots of videos of people playing Minecraft and it's this big open-ended sandbox game. that's very, very, very difficult. Now the challenge here is that unlike text, music and images where you get the next word, note or pixel for free, in any internet video, you, you see the agent doing its thing but you don't know what actions it's taking to accomplish that. That information is not provided. So we need the action taken at every time step. So what we do in this work is we take a, take a relatively simple idea, which is that we can just record some people playing Minecraft where we actually do record their actions. And we train a neural net to look at the past and the future of a video and just infer what action must have been taken at a time step in the middle. So for example, if you see an agent that jumps, you know it must have just hit the jump action. Same with uh, attacking or placing a block, et cetera. That's a pretty easy task, guessing the action in the middle. But once you have that inverse dynamics model trained, you can just go to the internet and now you can label all of the videos you find online with actions. And then you can just do standard behavioral cloning, imitation learning, kind of like GPT, but here VPT, where you go from past video to what action is the 
what's the next most the action for a human to take in that situation. And what we found is that if we train on about eight years of video, then um, these, you know, with a 500 million parameter neural net, then these agents can then start doing really impressive things, just zero shot. You just place them in the world and they go and they make crafting tables and wooden pickaxes and even get stone pickaxes, which if you're not a Minecraft player is a relatively uh, difficult task. It takes humans about uh, over two minutes and about 3000 actions to do that. But what really gets interesting is then when you start using reinforcement learning agent with the pre-trained agent as your starting place. And what we found is that if you can reward it, to, you can ask it to do something really hard, like go get a diamond pickaxe. This is a task that takes humans over 20 minutes, 24,000 actions to accomplish. So it's a really long, complicated sequence of um, precise actions. And with a pre-trained model, you can solve that task, as you see here in the red curve. If you try to do reinforcement learning without any pre-training, then basically you accomplish effectively nothing, which is what you see with the blue line on the bottom. And so the TLDR here is that we can stand on the shoulders of giant human data sets and really catalyze our efforts to create open-ended learning algorithms because our agents start out very smart. And then they can just like kind of learn from there as opposed to having to bootstrap all the way from zero. So to conclude the overall talk here, uh, I've introduced this idea of quality diversity algorithms. Uh, and I hope that I've shown you that they can explore problem domains really well. The general theme is that they create and collect this growing set of stepping stones where each stepping stone helps them unlock yet another stepping stone, just like evolution and human culture does. They harness the idea of goal switching, where you could be trying to solve one problem and all of a sudden realize that you've discovered something that works and helps on another problem. And they invent automatically these effective counterintuitive curricula in these search spaces and allow them to achieve really surprising things. I've also introduced this community of uh, people working on open-ended algorithms, which I hope you'll come join us. The goal here is to do something extremely ambitious, but that's also fun, which is to create algorithms that truly endlessly innovate and learn and, and, and forever. And so the idea, one way to, to motivate this is, you know, Right now, we do not know how to create an algorithm that would be worth running for uh, a year, let alone a billion years. But if you had create an open-ended algorithm, it would be should be interesting to come back and check on that thing every billion years. So how could we do that as a community? I think that's a grand challenge, and there's a Turing Award waiting out there for whoever can crack this. Uh, and I think to make progress on this, we probably need things like quality diversity algorithms, automatically generating environments, maybe pre-training with VPT, uh, and other innovations that hopefully you could help us discover. And so here's the final slide of the talk. Uh, to really conclude at the highest level, I think that it's really interesting in con to consider how one might you create these AI generating algorithms that automatically generate all the pieces they need and put these pieces together to uh, produce really powerful AI. I think it's a really fun challenge. It's very difficult. Uh, and probably it could be sped up with ideas like VPT and standing on the shoulders of giant human data sets. So with that, I wanna give a huge thing Thanks to so many collaborators that I didn't have a chance to mention by name. Here are the main ones, but there are many others. Please check our papers. I also want to once again thank Vector, the Fields Institute, uh, for the invitation and all of you for listening. Thank you very much.